I'm going to ask you to turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of John. I love the Gospel of John. It is my, I don't know, just wonderful, wonderful favorite. It's hard to have a favorite book in the Bible, but I would, if I had to be stranded somewhere with only one book, I'd, I'd take John Gospel up. It's just so wonderful. It's amazing. It just brings forth the, the fullness of Christ, the inclusion that he is the only Savior of the world. It's awesome, awesome. You know what? Even at nighttime, you can ask my wife. <laughs> After she falls asleep, I have my little phone and I have uh, YouTube. And I put, there's like uh, Gospel of John, the movie. It's good. It's actually one of those good. It's not so cheesy. Like Matthew's pretty cheesy. Luke's not that great either. But the Gospel of John uh, movie, it's pretty cool. Man. And it's it's nice. It's a great portrayal. Anyway, almost every night I, I watch that. I just... I probably should have told you that, but whatever. <laughs> a weird pastor thing, maybe. I don't know. Um, John chapter 12. Is that strange? Yeah. <laughs> Other nights, I'll just fall asleep. I'll just put Psalms on and just fall asleep. Listening to that. Anyway, giving you my nighttime routine here. Uh, John chapter 20. And I'm going to begin reading. And um, I'm sorry, John chapter 12. I'm going to be beginning in verse 20. To 36. And, and what's going on here? This is the final week of Jesus' earthly life on this earth uh, before his crucifixion. It's the coming to the end of his public ministry. That's where he's teaching everybody, teaching in the temple, teaching all kinds of people. This is, this is the last episode before he goes into just his uh, private ministry with his disciples, his apostles. Um, so it's coming to the end of his public ministry. No other gospel writer includes this account. But it goes along with the Gospel of John, just the purpose of John. Amazing, amazing Gospel that Jesus is the only Savior of men. You know, it's, um, it's very dramatic and very personable, like John's Gospel is. So, let's read uh, John 12, verses 20 through 36. Hear God's Word. Now, among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Oh, it's amazing. Now is my soul troubled now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, An angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, The voice has come for your sake and not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show what kind of death he was going to die. So the crowd answered, We've heard from the law that Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. Amen. 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 Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you so much for your precious word. I pray, Lord, that you would be with us, that our uh, mind would be focused upon you, Lord, upon your precious word, that you would be with me. Um, give me your words to speak, Lord, that we might be uh, edified, strengthened in our faith, and that you may be glorified. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So now here's the Feast of Weeks, and people are coming in from different places to see Jesus. And we're told here that the Greeks come. Who are the Greeks? They're not Jewish people. That's what this is. That's what it represents. And this is what I love about John's gospel, especially because it reaches out. It goes out to every single person. So these Greeks come and they want to see Jesus. The Greeks represent all non-Jews, just so you know that. Jesus is Savior of all. In verse 23, he says this. This is the appointed um, time. 
Jesus answered them, the hours come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Okay? And that's, that's an amazing thing, because this is the appointed time. This is why Jesus came. When Jesus said, this is the appointed time, Son of Man to be glorified, this is why he came. He was born in order to die for his people, for sinners. That's amazing. That's the heart of the gospel. This is why he came, in order to defeat Satan, sin, death, and hell. All right? And then he goes on and says, and he gives an illustration of that, and he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless the grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So he's talking about himself and what he came to do. This is what's so awesome about John, because we're just always confronted with this, with the gospel message, what Jesus came to do, and our response is to be in that regard. But there's, there's joy in the fact that we know that Christ came to die for sinners like us. That's our only hope, so there's joy in that. But there's also a sadness and a heaviness that's going to come out in just a little bit because it, it deals with death, right? <laughs> we don't like to deal with death. And yet, it is his death where our hope lies for life. And that's kind of like the paradox, seeming paradox in the Christian life. We don't want to associate that death in, in life, but having to die in order to have life. He said, the hours come to be glorified. What do you mean by that? So this is why I came. I'm glorified in my death, but also in my resurrection. It shows him to be the only Savior of the world. That's why he's saying this. I'm the only one. That's why the Greeks who come, and they represent all kinds of people, not just the Jews, but every single person. It's another way of saying, I'm the only way of salvation. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, that there is no other way. I've come to do what no one else can do. So he illustrates that by the absolute necessity of his death. He says a grain, a seed must perish. So if you have a seed and you just hold on to that, what's going to happen? Eventually nothing, unless you do what? Unless you plant it, unless you bury it, okay? in a sense, unless, unless it dies. Then it produces fruit. Then it can live. Then it grows. That's why he had to come. If Christ, if he doesn't die, and this is just another way of saying this, if Christ doesn't die, then there's no salvation for anyone. Right? It's just like that seed that's just sitting there. It's not going to do anything. It's going to sit on it and just crumble up. But it's his death that leads to our life. Right? It leads to salvation and to our resurrection. That seed is planted. That's why Jesus said that. That's that whole idea. And he goes on to say, and talks about this whole idea of life through death. Jesus says now, he kind of turns to, to others. He says, look, whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, my, the Father will honor him. This is so cool. This is amazing stuff because, again, it goes against everything we kind of think of in terms of this life in this world. He says this. This is the idea of life through death. Okay, Life through death. Death has to happen in order to have life. Jesus died so that we might live. Right? He died that we might live spiritually because apart from him, the Bible says we're dead in our trespasses and sins. As a matter of fact, I want you to turn with me to Ephesians. If you have your Bible, turn to Ephesians chapter 2. This is the idea of life through death. But we have to die before we can live. <laughs> or we're dead before we can actually live. It's kind of, oh, it's not the reverse. It's not life to death. It's dying in order to live. I want you to kind of get that point. Check out what Paul says. Now, he's talking to Christians now, right? Now, at this point, they're Christians. And he says to them, you guys, beginning in chapter 1 and verse 2, you were what? You were dead in your trespasses and sins, which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once formerly lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. See that? That's the deadness we were in. See, we were dead spiritually apart from him. This was our life apart from Jesus Christ. You were dead in your trespasses and your sins. It okay? doesn't mean you were as, as bad as you could be. You might be, even be a good person, but spiritually, you weren't connected to Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying here. Before Christ came, these guys that he's writing to, it applies to all Christians, all people, are dead in their trespasses and sins. Necros is the word. It's like a corpse. There's nothing you can do spiritually 
You're by nature children of wrath. You've disobeyed God. You're rebellious against God. You're, you're not seeking his way. That's what this is saying here in essence. By nature children of wrath. And then verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, for by grace you've been saved. There it is, man. That's the grace. It's nothing you do. It's nothing we can do. It's about his grace and about his mercy. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, he made us alive. We were dead in Christ. Now we're alive together with him, for by grace you have been saved. You've been saved by grace through faith. That's not your own. It's a gift of God, not a result of work, so, and so nobody can boast. Do you understand that? So that's that one way of, of life through death. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. What you do to make God love you? What you do to make God say yes to you, to bring you into it? Well, there's nothing we can do. It's by his grace alone. Right? So we're dead. We're made alive by him. As Christians, man, how are we supposed to live our lives? pleasing ourselves the way we did before Christ came in with the same kind of attitudes, the same kind of actions in our lives. And the, No, we live a different life now. We're told in Scripture that we died to that old man and we live to Jesus Christ. Paul puts it this way in Galatians 2.20. We talked about this in one of our sermons. Paul says this, I have been crucified with Christ. He wasn't literally crucified. He's talking inside. He's talking spiritually. If you're a Christian, this is where we go. That I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. My life is completely given over to him. Is yours, man. That's the hope. That's that we're so surrendered. We're so just overtaken by the Lord that our life is in him. It's not about what we want, but what he wants for us. You know, and we're, we're living in that way that, that I'm, I'm, I'm done with, with my sin. I'm done with my way when it goes against God's way. I want him in my life. I've been crucified with Christ. I died. Why? So I can live for him. I'm dead to my sins. I'm not going to do what I used to do. I'm not going to please the flesh like I used to please it. I'm going to live for him. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, that's so cool. That's, a, that's our life. That's what our life should look like. So given over to Christ. So we're not selfish. So we're not greedy. So we're not hurtful. So we're not hateful, man. So we're not that person we used to be. So we're not always lustful. So we're not always doing things that just please the flesh. But we're living for him, right? And we're giving and we're caring. And we're, and we're walking in a way that's obedient to him. There's a sense of real integrity. That's, that's who we are in Jesus Christ. Living for him by faith. But what? We have to die in order to live. Christ died for us so we can have life spiritually. And even on a physical level, man, for Christians, death isn't... Where is they staying, oh, death? Is it sad? Yes. Is it hurtful? Yes. Is it sorrowful? Yes. But for the true Christian, you can't feel too badly about it. (laughs) Because where are we going to go? We're going to be in his presence, man. And it's sad for us here and, and for those left behind, but not for for those in his presence. Man, that's that's what's so awesome about being a Christian. I've done funerals before for non-Christians. That's the hardest thing to do in the world. Yeah, you get an opportunity to preach the gospel, but you don't say your loved one is in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, where there's no more tears, no more sorrow, no more pain. Right? Where we're all going to be one day, those who believe in Jesus Christ. And there's hope in that. It's sad for sure, but not without hope. Understand? Even here, we must die physically, unless the Lord comes back. There's that little caveat in there. But we must die physically in order to be with him for eternity. See, it's all about death and life, man. We were dead spiritually. He made us alive. As Christians, we died ourselves in order to live for him. Even physically, we die in order to be with him for eternity, to be in his presence. That's the great consolation for, for Christians. And that's why we can't be overwhelmed or without hope. I've seen people without hope. I did a funeral not too long ago, and the kid was speaking. It was his dad passed away, such a nice guy, but he didn't know what to say. You know, my dad was a great man. He was an artist. He was there for us. And I hope he's, you know, having a, a big drink at the bar in the sky, you know. And, but there was, it was just such a hopelessness. Turn that around to a Christian funeral. Is there sadness? Yeah. Is there hurt? Yeah. 
But you know that they're in the presence of the Lord and people don't understand that. That's, that's the thing. For a Christian, the, 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 that overwhelming hopelessness of death and that overwhelming fear and that overwhelming of power has lost its grip. You have to die. We have to die in order to be in his presence. See, there's all kind of difficult things in a way, right? He died to make us alive spiritually. We need to die to ourselves to live to Christ. That's hard to do. That's our sanctification process. You know, we die physically in order to be with him. That's the gateway into his presence. So Paul says this in Philippians 1.21, and this is my life verse, I guess. I don't know. It's one of my life verses. <laughs> For me to live is Christ. That's it. Our life is all about Jesus Christ while we're here. We're about his business. We're living for him. And to die is gain. Why is it gain? Because we're in his presence. Because we're with him. There's that glorious hope of the gospel message. This is what we believe. And this is what we have to hold to. And we don't, don't get away from this. This is kind of, in, in one way, the goal of our lives. To live for Christ. And when we die, we know we're going to be in his presence with him. So it's gain. So there's there's good thing there. In John 14, 1 through 6, I'm going to read that passage. John 14 Listen to the comfort and the hope. Again, in this amazing gospel, John 14, verses 1 through 6, he's speaking to his disciples, but this could be extended to everyone who believes in him. Don't listen to people when they say, this was just for his people at that time and his disciples that were there. No, this is for all of us, man, or else we have no hope. You know, this is for... Jewish people, man, there's another. No, this is for them. It's for us, for all who believe. And listen to this. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. What comfort is that, man? That makes me almost want to go now. <laughs> Just like, I'm ready. Come on, Lord, please, right? And you know the way where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. We believe and we trust in him and we have our place secure in heaven. That's the hope of the Christian life. So there's no, we sing this song, no guilt in life, no fear in death. And there's a sense where that's really true. It doesn't mean that it's not hurtful or sorrowful, but there's that great hope that we have in Christ Jesus, right? Amen? Praise God. It's us. Right? So he says it. He says it himself right there. Our hope, and not just that, but the hope of the resurrection as well, man. That we're, that we're not, we're going to be in the Lord's presence, but it, a time, another time, when he comes back and establishes things here, we're going to be reunited with our bodies perfectly. No more death, no more sorrow, no more pain. So we also have the hope of the resurrection, the bodily resurrection. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 44 says this. Wow, this is long. I probably should have read. <laughs> so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown perishable, that's us, when we die. What is raised imperishable, should be is raised imperishable. Okay? Not to die anymore. It is sown in dishonor because of our sinfulness, our weakness of our body. It's raised in glory. Amen? It is sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It's sown in natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. If there's a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Do you see this? Do you see the point of this, guys? It's amazing. And take great comfort in this and great solace in this. This is our life. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. We're alive in Christ. While we're here, we die to ourselves in order to live for him. When we die, we go to be with him. That's it. Amen. Praise God. That's, that's why I can. This is what he's talking about here in this Gospel of John. Understand this. It's death to life. Pain to pleasure. For the Christian. This is why it's so important to preach the Gospel. This is why it's not just, you know, a pie in the sky. This is why we tell people about Jesus Christ. Because apart from him, it's not like this. It's a different story, man. For eternity. It's an eternity in hell under the wrath of God. No. This is why we preach it. This is why we tell other people about Jesus. You go from death to life, pain to pleasure, sorrow to joy, darkness to light. So then Jesus goes on and says, look, whoever loves his life, and people get all uptight about this, right? Whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Listen, when he says this, whoever loves his life, he doesn't mean that you have to hate your life. <laughs> you're a Christian, and that you can't enjoy life, that you can't go for the good things and, and have, a, you know, 
a good life in that sense to, to a degree. But if that's exclusively your life, if you're living apart from him, and this life is all that you have, right? If you have no hope, for eternal life in Christ Jesus, then you're in trouble. That's why he says, he who loves his life is going to lose it. If you love your life so much in this world, if you live just for this world and the things of this world, you're going to end up in a very bad place. Okay, Just like the rich the rich fool. Um, I do want to read that again. I'm, I'm having you turn a little bit today. Let's go to the Gospel of Luke. Let's go backwards a few pages. Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 16. I want you to hear this. Luke 12, 16. And this is for the people that live for this life only. This is why Jesus says, if you love your life, you're going to lose it. Again, he's not saying you have to hate yourself, you have to hate this world. You have, but if it's not exclusively, if this is your only hope, if you only go around once, that kind of idea, get all you can while you're here, go for the gusto, then you're in big trouble. Because this is exactly the story of the rich fool, beginning in verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But Jesus said to him, Man, who made me judge or arbiter over you? And he said to them, Take care, be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And that's when you love your life, this life only. You live for this life, to get all you can, to have all that you will, to to have pleasure in this life, because then that's all there is. No. He told them a parable saying, The land of a rich man produced plentiful. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? I have nowhere to store my crops. See the arrogance? He had all this food, all all this money, all the crops. I have no place to go. He said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. And there I'll store my grains and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. Isn't that the goal of this life? Let's just get everything we can, have all we want, and eat, drink, be merry. Retire at 55 and live our lives out in the way we want to. Jesus said, you fool. This night your soul is required of you, and the things that you prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. You understand that? See what he's saying there? If you live for that, that's when he says you have to hate your life. We don't hate our lives. We don't beat ourselves, you know, and, and, and try to become holy in that way. He's just saying if you live for this life exclusively, then you have no hope of eternity in Christ. If you live your life exclusively for now, this is as close to heaven as you'll ever get. That's it. And people say, oh, no, 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 life, this is hell. Our life on earth is hell. No, 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 this isn't hell. You, you better be careful when, when you hear people say that. Hell is far different than this. This is as close to heaven as you will get. You still enjoy the benefits of God, right? The air that you breathe, the sun that shines, what you're able to do in this life. That's all from God. When you die apart from Christ, that's not going to be the case. Understand? If you're not a Christian, this is as close to heaven as you'll get. But if you are a Christian, this is as close to hell as you'll ever be, right? (laughs) And you could say life on earth is hell because this is as close as we'll be to hell. No. This is as close to hell as you ever get because in his presence is joy continually. Right? Amen. When he says hates his life, he doesn't mean despise his life, but he understands that there's something far better for the Christian. You're not to hate your life again as Christians. We don't do that. We can enjoy life. Go to the ball game, opening days today, enjoy, you know, uh, have that. That's all good. But you have to understand that there's something far better awaiting us in Christ. We are sojourners in this world. We're passing through our permanent residence is not here. If this is all you have, if this is all you're doing, if you're so afraid to die, you know what, and you're holding on to your last breath, you, that's not Christian. If you're a Christian, you understand that our citizenship is not here. As a matter of fact, Paul says in Philippians 3.20, check it out. Our citizenship is where? On the earth? Is this it for us? Is this no, our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're just passing through. We're ambassadors here. We have a far better place. Do you see this? This death leading to life. Death leading to life. Dead in our trespasses and sins, we're made alive. Die to self in order to live for him. When we die in Christ, we will be with him. That's the gateway. That's the hope of Christianity. That's the hope of the Christian. You have that hope this morning? You better if you're a Christian. Amen? 
Doesn't mean there's not sadness. Doesn't mean there's not hardship. Because look what Jesus goes on to say. Check this out. He says this in verse 27. Now my soul is troubled. (laughs) Okay, so here's he's talking about life and death, and it's good. But he also says, My soul is troubled. And that's so revealing because he is facing death. And there is a sense where, yes, death is a way to life, but death itself is troublesome and it's worrisome, right? Death entered the human race as a consequence of sin. So it is something that is ugly. It is something that is hard. It is something that's sorrowful. It is that too, because that's not the way it ought to be. And we know that. That's why we get sorry when people die, at least when most people die. When some people die, you're like, oh, I'm glad. No, not really. But you know, there's that sadness when, when, when people die because it's tragic, it's painful, it involves great sorrow because it ought not be this way. And it wasn't this way originally, right? There was no death in the world until Adam and Eve fell. Death entered in as a consequence. But guess what? There will be in the future no death. There will be no more death, no more tears, no more sorrows in Christ the way it was originally. Jesus is so revealing here as, as he's facing death. He said, look, my soul is troubled. He was very human. He was, Again, in his humanity, he was, he was like us. You know, crazy about the prospect of it. And he's there, and his soul was troubled facing death. But then he says, what should I do? Call to the Father and say, no, but for this very purpose I came. His love for the Father, his love for you, and his love for me overrode any kind of fear that he had or trouble that he had facing that death. He knew what was waiting at the end of that. Do you understand? And more than that, when he talks about Jesus um, being troubled in this way, I'm, I, it's not so much, I don't believe so much the, the prospect of, of facing death, of all dying, but having to go through what he was going to go through for us but especially when the back of the Father was turned on him and all the wrath of the Father, whom he had this fellowship with, was poured out on him. That's, that's that, that trouble, that, that absolute separation from the Father and feeling the Father's wrath upon him. So Jesus says, my soul is troubled. And that's personified in, in the garden, right? Even in the garden, here's Jesus in his humanity and crying out to the Lord. He says this, going a little farther, he fell on his face praying, my father, if it's possible, let this cup pass before me nevertheless. And there's that dependence and there's that love for the father and for us. Not as I will, but as you will. Let your will be done. He knew what he had to endure, what he would endure for the father and for us. He says, yet shall I, shall, I, shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? Mm-mm. But for this purpose I came. I love that because that shows his love for us. This is why I came. To do this very thing so that you might have life. So you don't have to suffer the consequence of your sins. So your sins may be forgiven and you may be in heaven. That's amazing. His love for us and the Father comes through. This is why he came. This is what he came to do. He understands the necessity of the pain, and it's not pleasing. Dying is not a delight, but it shows the severity of the fall, just how far we've fallen in the consequence of sin and what's needed to bring us apart from that. So it shows the severity of the fall and also the depth of his love at the same time. Amen? Good stuff. Good stuff. So he goes on. The voice from heaven speaks out. People say they hear thunder and whatnot, or an angel speaking. He glorifies the Father, and the Father says, um, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. That's what the Father says to him about, about Christ. The Father was glorified in the ministry of his Son, that Jesus was faithful, that he carried out what he would do as the Father sent him. Again, he would be glorified in his death and in his resurrection. His plan, his purpose, his decree to redeem a people by sending his son to live a life that they never could, a perfect life, to die the death they should have died, to be raised on the third day, it satisfies God's justice, satisfies his wrath. He was buried and raised up, and that assures us of the victory against Satan, sin, death, and hell. That's it. The Father sent him, and he's glorified 
in that. And that's the defeat of Satan. Verse 31, now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. That's it. At the cross, that's where the price was paid. That goes all the way back to Genesis 3.15. I think we have that. This is the first promise of the gospel in the entire Bible, and we see it culminating in the cross. I will put enmity between you and the woman, as he's speaking to the serpent, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. That's exactly what happens at the cross. This culminates where Satan bruises his heel, Christ is crucified, seeming victory for him, but no, Christ's death actually secures salvation for all who believe in him, and his resurrection proves that. So you have that culmination of this promise early on in Scripture at the cross where Satan is cast out. You see that victory? That's why we can live. That's why we live. That's why we have hope. That's why our sins are forgiven, because Christ did this. He crushed the head of Satan, not only through his death, but also through his resurrection of Christ. So see how cool that is, how this passage comes together over here. So Jesus says this, now the judgment is of now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out, and when I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw, draw all people to myself. I just want to put a word here on this passage, because Jesus is not talking about universal salvation. Now, some people say, see, all people are going to be saved. All people are going to come. No, there's a distinction there. In this context, remember, the Greeks came in. The, the outsiders came in along with the Jews. So he's not talking, and if you look at the testimony of Scripture, not everybody's saved. That would be cool. That would Universalism would be cool, that we could live the way we want and die and everybody go to heaven. That would be nice. But that's not the way it is, man, and we can't say that it's like that. That's where people get upset and say, well, oh, wow, that's not fair. No, it is fair. We deserve his wrath, right? It's only by his grace that we're saved. We can't live the way. He's not saying, I'm going to draw every single person to myself that that person's going to be saved. People don't like Christ. People reject Christ. People hate Christ. Right? He changes our heart. And then we come to him as he pours out his grace on us. It's not universal salvation. What he's talking about here is all kinds of people. Whether your background is Greek, whether your background is Jewish, whatever your background is, you who come and believe in Christ will be saved. So. It's without distinction, but not without exception. Not everybody is saved, but only those who believe. And then finally, verse 34, he says this. So the crowd answered him, We have heard from, from the law that Christ remains forever. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in darkness does not know where he's going. While you have light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. Do you understand what he's saying here? Jesus gives a warning, but he also gives a promise. The warning is against our own ideas of salvation. See, these people are sitting there saying, look, man, we thought that the Savior's going to be come in and he's going to take over in Rome and he's going to defeat them. No, you have the wrong idea of salvation. People have their own ideas about it. Look, there's other paths. Jesus isn't the only way. You could do it this way. No, Jesus is the only way. That's what he's saying here. That's why he's saying that, in essence, he's saying that the offense of the cross hasn't ceased. People want a Jesus they can manage. People want a gospel that suits them. People want something where they could say, I could do basically what I want and then get into heaven. No, that's not what it is. People want to say, well, I think it's this way. Isn't it supposed to be like this? No, here it is. Here's the way that Jesus came. And this is the offense of the cross. It hasn't ceased because people are still troubled by the truth of their need for the cross of Christ, that their only hope is a crucified Savior. But it's through that cross that we obtain life, right? It's a call to trust in him. He says, look, I'm the light, and I'm here. If you believe in me, you'll have life. I've overcome the darkness. This is Jesus, who would not let his troubled soul or his fear of facing death overcome his love for the Father and for his people. Understand? That's the love of Christ. He's on his way to the cross. He's moving towards it. At this point, his public ministry is over. From now on, he's just going to be, uh, he turns to his apostles as he makes his way to the cross. We'll pick up with that next week.